Sergi Corbalan from Fair Trade Advocacy Office. And just to explain, uh, this is uh, the project that you are part of is academic, but also with a lot of involvement of those uh, that are really working on sustainability, working on sustainable public procurement uh, on the ground. In different roles, international organizations, multilateral development banks, and with different uh, capacities. And uh, they not just host uh, secondments, they also uh, do help uh, uh, us in training by sharing uh, uh, their experience. And uh, of course, uh, sorry, Sergi, uh, looking at them, the problem is that you can't, it seems you are talking to an empty room, it's not like this, there are, there are really people, real people, it's not uh, on uh, uh, line. And no, after all these years, you might imagine I'm talking about to whom I'm talking, but uh, uh, Sergi will talk us about two very important aspects communication and advocacy. How you really uh, can convince people that sustainability is really important, is about your future, our future, my kids, our kids' future. So that's, uh, I think, uh, is enough. I was buying a little bit of time. Thanks again. The floor is uh, yours. Thanks again a lot, Sergi. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me well and you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Perfect. So, uh, yeah, greetings everyone. Um, pity that I cannot join, of course, this, the circumstances still do not make it easy. Hope uh, we can meet in the future with all of you. Um, so, greetings from rainy Brussels today. We are a bit depressed. We've realized that the winter is approaching today. Um, and I hope the weather is a bit better in Turin. Um, so, my name is Sergi. I'm originally from Barcelona, but I've been living in Brussels for a long time. And I'm the director of the Fair Trade Movement Political Advocacy Office uh, in Brussels. So, first of all, I, I would like to explain what fair trade is. In Italian, commercio eco e solidale. It is a way of doing business that actually contributes to greater equity for international trade. It ensures better trading conditions to marginalized producers and workers, especially in the South. So that's the definition of fair trade. Now, what about my office? So we are only one part of the fair trade movement. We are um, a joint initiative by the different European and international fair trade networks uh, set up in 2004 in Brussels. And our aims are about monitoring and influencing EU legislation, policies and their implementation. And I'll talk more about that, as uh, Roberta, you've mentioned. And we also catalyze fair trade movement collaboration at international level. So for example, we are now coordinating the engagement of the fair trade movement in relation to the climate change COP26 uh, conference coming up in Glasgow. And we also facilitate the sharing and co-creation of knowledge by fair trade movement and researchers. So this is, of course, an important part of our work. And, it, and uh, also very happy that the Sapiens project is part of this area of our work of cooperation with researchers. So now, who is behind us? Because we are a small office, but who is the movement behind us? The fair trade movement is a social movement. So that means that it's not one organization and there is no boss of the fair trade movement. It is a movement that is made up of people that are committed to promote fair trading conditions and uh, for disadvantaged producers. Um, 
it's composed mainly and firstly by producers, actually farmers, textile workers, artisans that actually work and actually benefit from better trading conditions that fair trade offers. Um, the fair trade movement is also about campaigning. This is, for example, an action that took place in the UK um, a few months ago when unfortunately um, Nestle dropped uh, the fair trade label for the Kit Kat bars that were fair trade in the UK and in Ireland. So it wasn't everywhere, but it was at least in these two countries, but they decided to go away and then do their own thing. Um, and they say it's the same, but it isn't. Anyway, so there was a petition and there was a lot of um, then campaigning to encourage Nestle to stick and to stay with fair trade producers. The fair trade movement is also about companies that import fair trade. Uh, it's also about retailers, specialized shops, uh, Bottega del Mondo in Italy and many other names across Europe. In Germany, there are 700 fair trade shops, for example, so specialized retailers. And then let me tell you now a bit more about um, three exact, exciting campaigns. And it's part of doing advocacy and it's part of doing communication. So the first is the International Fair Trade Towns campaign. I will talk about briefly afterwards about the schools campaign and the universities campaign. I guess the most developed is the International Fair Trade Towns campaign. Actually, there are more than 2,000 local authorities that are officially part of this global campaign. Gardstein in the UK was the first one. And now, as you can see in the map on the screen, there is many, uh, there is more than 2,000, 2,080. Uh, that's the latest count. A lot of them in Europe um, and then also in North America and in other continents. I find particularly exciting that recently there are more and more cities in Latin America that are also becoming part of the Fair Trade Towns campaign, which is interesting because it is a move of the Fair Trade movement to not also promote Fair Trade from the Global South to the Global North, which was a bit the old pattern, but equally, not replacing, but equally also from the South to the South and also from the North to the North, as there is also a growing number of domestic fair trade initiatives, actually. Um, now, if you want to know more about the International Fair Trade Towns campaign, actually, it's quite interesting and, and timely because next month, on 18 and 20 November, Swiss Fair Trade, which is the Swiss Fair Trade platform, is actually hosting online uh, an online conference of the International Fair Trade Towns campaign. It is free. And I want to highlight that there's many interesting sessions, but there is one session specific to public procurement, which is happening on November 19. You see the details on the screen. I can only encourage you to check it out and join if you want to know more about what fair trade towns are doing in relation to public procurement. Now, beyond the fair trade towns campaign, there is also the fair trade schools campaign. There is less schools than cities, and it's a bit less countries, so it doesn't happen in all the countries, but where it works, it's obviously a very useful way to raise awareness of, of young students about um, the relevance of their purchasing decisions, and obviously to educating future consumers and future citizens about the importance of fair and sustainable consumption and production. And for a bit of an older kind of population group, there is also a fair trade universities campaign. Uh, this is an example of a recent celebration of the University of Cordoba in Spain. They were celebrating 10 years as a fair trade university. What does fair trade university mean? Well, it's it, it's it's a it's becoming part of a campaign that is about promoting fair trade and sustainable consumption and production. It's linked to promotion activities, to procurement by the University of Fair Trade Goods and so on. I can send you more information for those that are interested. Now, one of our main most important uh, actions um, has been uh, work to explain that fair trade is actually a way to localize the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. 
And here you will find an overview of some recent publications, which we can send to you if interested, which is all about how to localize the SDGs through fair trade. And uh, public procurement is clearly one of the key ways to do so. And as you know, there is a dedicated um, SDG sub objective and indicators in relation to public procurement, sustainable public procurement. So what is recent work of, of our office? So we have been, I mean, and I've chosen topics that are relevant, I believe, to the project, um, to the SAPIX project. So for example, a very interesting report, which I encourage you to read, is that we've done a joint publication with Circle Economy, <coughs> the European Environmental Bureau, in relation to a the blind spots of circular economy. This is a constructive analysis of what is the circular economy offering, but also shedding light on the, the risks that actually that are either unaddressed or unknown very often in circular economy business models. And we identified different types of blind spots and we offered recommendations to companies and also to public procurers. We actually did a follow-up publication um, for the city of Bremen in Germany, who is a fair trade town, but also wants to become a, a, a pioneer of circular procurement. And they said, how can we combine circular economy principles to fit our existing sustainable public procurement and practices? And here in this publication, we identified front runner procurers, fair trade towns, that are committed to both green and social public procurement. We identified good practices and we gave some guidance to procurers. What are our future plans? Well, uh, as, as, so as it has been mentioned, so we have a, a formal role in this project as we will host a researcher in 2023 for three months from ECR 14 on circular textiles. And obviously, we're also open to work with other researchers that will work on other topics, for example, on human rights and on circular economy. For us, it is very important to connect, right, uh, the different dots as we are interested equally in circular textiles as on human rights and on circular economy. So we look forward to cooperation. And also for you to know our advocacy work in the coming months and years. So at EU level, you may know that there are very high level political discussions about future rules at EU level to ensure respect of human rights and environment across supply chains. And this will translate in the coming months in a legislative proposal by the European Commission on sustainable corporate governance, including an obligation of human rights and environmental due diligence. So we are very active trying to shape this process as much as possible because we support this initiative and we want to make sure that it really encourages companies to change their purchasing practices, their behavior. We do not want these due diligence processes to be only a legal way to pass on responsibility to the weak parts of the chain. We actually want to change in the behavior of companies and the prices they pay to their weak suppliers. We're also gonna be busy in trying to shape sectoral policies like on textiles. The EC is actually expected to publish in the coming months a new strategy on textile supply chains. Uh, this is one of the follow-ups of the EU Circular Economy Action Plan. We're also very busy shaping the policies of the EU on food systems, the farm to fork strategy, which includes in one of its action points, the promotion of mandatory criteria for sustainable food. Now, it was supposed to be short term. We hear now rumors that this has been postponed to later, to maybe one or two years later, but nevertheless, there is an intention of the commission to develop mandatory criteria for sustainable food. And we're gonna be shaping that or trying to. How are we gonna do it? With directly our contacts in the EU institutions, of course, so the European Commission, the European Parliament, and also engaging with the national governments at EU level in cooperation with our members. That means that uh, 
we shape, we try to shape EU policies by speaking directly to the Commission in Brussels, the members of Parliament mainly in Brussels, but of course, as you know, the Council of Ministers, this is mainly through the capitals that you achieve change at through that level. So we work with our members to ensure that we pass coordinated asks and demands across the EU. But we also do it in, in by networking with others, civil society organizations, trade unions, social enterprises, and committed um, public procurers. So we are a member of the Food Policy Coalition Public Procurement Working Group. And we are the co-coordinator of the Civil Society Organizations Network for Sustainable Public Procurement, which is not only about food, but other sectors. And we also are coordinators of a Rethinking Value Change Collective, which is a network of committed civil society organizations that believe in uh, transformation of supply chains to make them work for people and planet. And in that context, we will organize in cooperation with uh, Electronics Watch and Industry All, the Trade Union Federation, a, a, we, a webinar, a series of six webinars starting the first in November this year and then the others next year in relation to the topic of public procurement and due diligence. How to make sure that due diligence by public procurers translates into in better working conditions and sustainability in supply chains. Don't hesitate to let me know if you wish to be invited. Um, I would love also to highlight that we are also member, in this case partner, uh, of another type of Horizon Europe project, which is called School Food for Change. Um, and in case we can connect you or we can encourage cooperation between the two projects, we can. We would be delighted to do so, as we are involved in both. Um, this one is specifically about food in schools, and it will be about a new paradigm uh, combining different sustainability and health aspects. And there will be um, a lot of activities and rolling out sustainable and healthy school meals. It will be all about solutions of, <laughs> sorry, about solutions to promote what is called a whole school approach, which means like it's not only about changing the food that is sold, it's about awareness raising and mobilization of the community in support of healthy and sustainable food. And it will be about uh, the upgrading school canteens and cooks um, and so to promote them becoming more sustainable. Anyway, so if we can offer any cooperation, let us know. Thank you for your attention at this stage. And I remain, um, I hope I have covered at least some of the issues and now I'm very happy to answer any question uh, that you may have. And of course, don't hesitate to contact me um, if you want to receive more info. Uh, thanks a lot, Sergi. This was really smack on a, a topic because was building a, a very, very well on what we were uh, discussing uh, this morning, uh, the difficulties of monitoring the supply chain, the due diligence, uh, and uh, uh, really, uh, there is much room for cooperation, which goes uh, much beyond just uh, hosting one of our ESR. So I'm very happy to give the floor uh, to our participants for uh, questions, uh, remarks. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Jones and I'm working for ESR 14. Nice to meet you. So actually I'll be, oh, sorry. So actually I will be the one who joined your organization next year. Ah, uh, nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you online. <laughs> uh, basically, my background is not from social science, so I'm not going to ask something about the sectoral policies and everything. But um, I was, uh, I'm a little bit curious about your progress so far about this project, like EU sectoral policies on textile, since you're um, focusing on circular economies, like uh, what have you done so far? And do you also like collaborating with some companies like in like focusing in production or maybe also like um, 
return logistic for the disposal process or something like that. I'm sorry if my uh, questions probably like too technical, but thank you so much. Okay, so yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so, um, the, we, we, our priority area of work of our office here in Brussels is of course shaping policy processes, right? And, and sharing knowledge. But our founding members, the fair trade organizations across Europe and globally are engaging in business, both they are social enterprises or they are NGOs that work with large companies to make their supply chains fair at a time. And it is there that, of course, these innovations happen. So there's quite a lot of fair trade enterprises produce organizations that are actually moving on from a simple model of fair trade, which maybe initially was only based, well, it had the focus and rightfully so about the, you know, the welfare of workers, the price paid to producers, the working conditions, and now they are integrating environmental and circular economy principles. So there's plenty of cases of, um, you know, if you go to one of the shops uh, on fair trade, you will find um, plenty of products that are made of recycled materials, reused materials. So I think that there is a lot of interest in going in that direction. Um, Obviously, as you know, uh, there is also some evolutions in Europe. Like, for example, I find you, you, may, you may have read about it already, but for example, uh, unless our information is wrong, the, 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 the Dutch army, for example, uh, for their textiles, not only they had a policy of responsible sourcing, they also had a policy of, um, in, in the spirit of circular economy, combining also social principles. For example, that when the uniforms uh, reach their lifetime um, limit, they are actually sent to a social local enterprise in the Netherlands that has social objectives to actually reuse and transform the uniforms into something else. So by doing that, it's about giving a new life to textiles. So it's combining social issues in the production of the original material, but also social objectives in what happens after. So we believe these are the kind of good practices that should be promoted. As I said before, it's about combining a circular economy and fair trade objectives, right? And and this is also our advocacy work at EU level. We try to promote a textile strategy at EU level that doesn't only look at textile supply chains from the angle of circular economy. We say, of course, we need to look at it from the circular economy and promote more circularity, but we also need to look at human rights and social impacts in the manufacturing of the of garments, in the production of the fibers like cotton, which, as you know, they are very uh, intense in terms of uh, human rights and environmental impacts. So we believe, therefore, that uh, we don't want the circularity to replace existing sustainability concerns. We want circularity to build on other existing legitimate concerns. And that is our, these are our calls on the European Commission. Um, we'll see how successful we are. Um, we need to see in some months when we see the, the strategy coming out and then we will need to do an evaluation about how much we have achieved these objectives. So I hope I have answered at least partially to your, to your question. Yes, perfect, thank you. Uh, do you have any idea of uh, when it will be that uh, uh, the EU institutions, they do start really working on, uh, for instance, the farm to fork strategy and these different uh, policies they have outlined. So, what is the specific question? Where to find more info? Uh, now, if you have any info or any idea of uh, when it will be the right moment 
to know their starting point uh, to have a possibility yeah, yeah. to let's say say something yeah yeah that's right um so the farm to fork is way more advanced in general than the textile work it, because it was launched first and there is a lot of work streams that are already ongoing now of the farm to fork uh, they are doing all sorts of things uh, however on public procurement it's a bit stuck the issue because the commission is not still finding the right way so let's say that how to put it the european commission at top level committed to promoting mandatory sustainable food criteria but then the technical officials are really struggling to do it in a way that is legally okay and also politically acceptable because as we know there is very different uh, practices in terms of sustainable procurement across the EU you cannot compare northwest country to a southeast country typically in relation to how much they already do sustainable procurement right so when you require something on a mandatory basis then there it, it it all becomes very complex so i think that the window of opportunity is there as i said we understand that initially they wanted to launch a public consultation on this this year but it may be delayed i can keep you posted on this this is also our contribution to the project if yes, that can be helpful okay. and and then we can let you know of opportunities um to 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 give input of course and for you to invite right officials obviously Anna Lupi is of course a very good uh, I would say the best choice about somebody that has a generalist approach to public procurement but then of course there is also some different officials that are working specifically on on the topic of sustainable food procurement for example which I can put you in touch with and then on textiles well we uh, as I said before uh, we are asking the EU to put in place an ambitious chapter on public procurement or some actions on public procurement in in that textile strategy of the eu now we do not know we do not know if they are going to be doing it it's not so easy so we'll see uh, if they simply say oh it's nice to promote fair and sustainable textile procurement but they leave it optional or whether they take a more of a proactive approach like they did for food still to be seen uh, thank you very much there is a question in the chat if you could just send uh, please the link uh, to the beyond buying guide uh, for public procurement yes. if you can put that in the chat in the meantime i think aura has a question ASR3, uh, you hustle. Well, June. Okay. I, I have just a little question on the technical aspect of this uh, guideline because I was wondering, since I'm going to work on uh, circular economy, I wanted to know like, uh, what kind of data did you use? Which were sources? Who worked on this? Because I'm really interested so, since I'm starting this PhD. Thank you very much. Or bedank. <laughs> um, so I'm assuming that you're, you're, you're talking in relation to this publication, right? Uh, that I'm showing. So we worked with Circle Economy, which is kind of a leading uh, consultancy firm specialized in Circle Economy and the European Environmental Bureau. And, uh, and, and actually they did research uh, with interviews and some desk uh, research on business models. Um, and, you know, I will send you the link as well to the, there's plenty of references in the publication. Um, it's a long chapter of, uh, of uh, bibliography. So I'll send you the links. What I will do is that I will include the links of the publications, maybe in the slides or something, and then I can send them around and, and maybe uh, the team can send them around so that you, you have that. Yes, sure. We will just make sure that we upload 
all these materials uh, among our materials, okay? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, we have one, uh, two questions. Uh, you first, and then Margot Chata. Hi, uh, Haytham, uh, ESR6, you hassled also. I'm gonna ask also a similar question to Aura. So are you using uh, a, uh, uh, like a standard or a formula for uh, determining circularity? Like uh, for example, the product environmental footprint, uh, the European Commission uh, just started with, uh, they have the circularity footprint formula or are you using uh, a more advanced uh, LCA methodology? Thank you. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I can answer. To be honest, I think I would need. To, I would need to check. And actually, you know, um, I I don't want to present ourselves as the reference on circular economy. I think we're not. I think my point in in in, in presenting this. Uh, publication that we made was actually to show that we're trying to connect the dots in a way, right? So I will, but if you write to me, I will, I will not only, I will send you the publication, but also I can, uh, I can ask um, maybe the, the experts on, on that wrote the other parts of the publication from Circle Economy, maybe they could answer, right? Um, I think to me, the message to get across is that, as I said before, that it's a more a political method is to say, um, no matter what methodology we come up with, um, let's make sure that we don't forget that there are other sustainability objectives and that circular economy methodologies and business models should not be blind to these risks. I guess that, that's, I guess, our policy message, but very happy to to be in touch, and as you're in Hasselt, of course, uh, feel free to, to let us know if you're in Brussels and happy to catch up. Hello, in fact, I uh, don't have a specific question. I just want to say uh, hello, because I have a great pleasure to supervise uh, plan on, on her, uh, her topic on circular textiles, and I'm so happy that you will have a chance to be at uh, uh, at your office, and uh, I only want to comment. Uh, I am looking for and reading all the documents that, uh, that you issue. I um, uh, didn't found this one, and I think it is a, a great thing because um, we talk a lot about the circular circularity in textiles in the context of environmental aspects, business models, but not much about the social aspects. And so that's great that something like that was issued and I think it would be a base for uh, Jen for her project. So look forward to cooperation. Just. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Same here. Uh, do we have another? Uh, uh, there was a question that was already addressed. Uh, uh, do we have other uh, question for Sergi? Okay, uh, so for uh, the moment, and this is just for the first get together, and we hope uh, to uh, meet uh, you in person uh, soon in one of our ATCs, and uh, of course, uh, again. Uh, thank you for being so available to share your resources, uh, your knowledge, and uh, uh, just rest assured that uh, uh, we really want uh, to do the same. Uh, we will be ready to uh, share all research, any uh, ideas we can uh, come up uh, um, during these, uh, well, we, especially the PhDs, will come up during these years. It's not just one ESR. It's really a group of people working on sustainable public procurement at what uh, I called this morning a very auspicious time. Yes. yes. So many things are happening. That's, that's great. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I look forward to working with you. Um, we. 
and if you have a the PhDs are welcome to contact us as well um, and if, if because we could maybe identify some of the questions that maybe we don't have the time to go deeper into and that could be helpful because we believe that um, the more that um, that research is based on problems from the ground uh, of course the more useful it can be and sometimes we don't have the capacity or the time to do that uh, and I think also in relation to policy processes, I think I, I can only encourage you to also meet with public procurers and with policy officials and we can help maybe with some EU policy officials to also understand their needs and questions as this will mean that your research will be more impactful as well. So Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's, that's really the point uh, uh, that uh, all this program is trying to make is not uh, just the ivory tower. Yeah. in our small closet thinking it's really trying to think make good science and have an impact thanks really again thank you have a good uh, rest of the meeting <laughs>